everyone. Um, if you would like the recording, you can um, you can just contact LEAD and ask for it. Um, it's not going to be sent out to everyone as a matter of course, but if you, for example, struggle with connectivity uh, partway through the seminar um, or you need to leave for some urgent reason or something like that, please feel free to ask for the recording. There's also a recording available of yesterday's session. Sam's story uh, just requested and it can be emailed to you. OK, um, quick reminder to everyone uh, just to uh, mute your video, uh, mute your, your um, microphone and turn your video off um, so none of us are distracted. I can hear somebody. <laughs> um, uh, then, the, yeah, just to just to explain the materials that we're going to be working off today are few. Uh, there, there's much less than uh, the materials for yesterday. Um, just the slides and a list of the cases. You'll see on the list of the cases that there's a link included that takes you to um, to the Safley website with where where you can uh, get free access to the uh, to the entire judgment. So please make full full use of that um, uh, after the seminar. Then I am regretfully announcing that there won't be space for um, for asking and answering questions today. Uh, I suppose you're welcome to uh, to make comments, and um, that I really would uh, would very much welcome. Please make those in writing on the chat function. Um, what we are going to do is to answer the many questions that were left over from yesterday and couldn't fit into the time. Um, yesterday's session uh, was supposed to have been uh, 10 to 12.30 and, and that's what you paid for. Um, for those of you who stayed to the end, there was quite a bit of bonus time um, where I answered a whole lot of questions and then finished the slides as well. If you had to leave at the, at the um, time, uh, which was which was scheduled. Once again, feel free to ask for the recording so that you can get the answers to the questions and the rest of the slides um, if you feel that would be beneficial. OK, I'm going to. Um, switch to the slides for a bit and then we're going to go back to the questions. So what we're dealing with today, you're going to see that I've, I've included a whole lot of the um, uh, slides from uh, from yesterday's presentation again and we'll go through them at the speed of lightning but I just wanted them there so that you have the full picture so if we go through a slide quicker than you're able to even read it don't worry it's because you've you saw it yesterday um, there are also a whole lot of slides included toward the end of the seminar that um, uh, that I'm not even going to I'll, I'll flip through them and I'm not going to discuss them at all. Those are summaries of the of, of recent case law, but up to um, up to last year. Um, I'm going to be discussing, there is so much new case laws. I'm going to be discussing 14 new judgments in the course of today's seminar. So, um, so there simply isn't space uh, to include all of the rest of it, but I've given you a short summary, which hopefully will... Um, uh, will be a useful resource for you going going forward. So that's a story with regard to the slides. Um, just a bit of background. Let's just get our bearings again with the Consumer Protection Act. It was signed into law 2009 and it's come into effect. Um, the early effective date was the 24th of April 2010 and the general effective date, which is relevant for most of our um, uh, purposes, was 31st March 2011. OK, careful. Uh, there were some press reports around that time that created the impression that the act became effective on the 1st of April. Please regard that as an April Fool's joke. It's not right. The um, Government Gazette refers to the 31st of March 2011. Um, the Act doesn't have a retrospective effect, obviously, um, uh, but there, there are still some cases, some um, uh, decisions that have not come into effect. Um, those are the ones that refer to business names, that's the name for the for what we would call a trading as name. Um, they were deferred and the minister is supposed to issue a notice at some stage. That's gone very quiet and there's no indication of when that will 
uh, will happen. Um, when it does happen, um, I've said to my clients they must um, they must immediately register their trading as names. Let's say you've got a client called um, Johnny's Auto Spares trading as PJF um, <laughs> Hair Salon, or not trading at the moment in, in that case. Um, uh, the, the, the trading as name must be registered on the register that will be announced in terms of section 79 and 80 in due course, um, if that it will ever happen, um, ASAP, um, because that will provide um, protection in respect of that name, which is quite similar to trademark protection, but without the, the delay um, or expense. Okay. What are we discussing today? Today is an update. So I'm not going to be covering the whole CPA. I'm going to be focusing on the new case law. I'm not even going to have time to cover all of the new um, rulings that have come out of the National Consumer Tribunal. Those don't have the, um, the ability to create a precedent. So they, um, they give us a nice indication of how the, the um, tribunal is thinking and they're very and there are lots of them so that's very uh, helpful um, you can access them on um, both on safely which is lovely because then it's searchable by topic um, and there's a and there's a summary um, uh, or otherwise on the um, uh, national Cons uh, consumer tribunals website they have a they have a heading which is which is where all the judgments um, uh, are listed by year. There are a ton of them. And unfortunately, they mixed up, the CPA ones are mixed up with the ones that were um, rulings that were reached under the National um, Credit Act. So you have to sort of sift through those if you're looking for a CPA judgment. Okay, so it's actually altogether a little bit easier to to search through. Um, the ombuds, uh, there are, there's some material of the consumer um, goods and services ombud on SAFLI as well. So yeah, you can um, search for consumer protection on SAFLI and there is a mass of um, useful information that comes up. So they're a really helpful resource. Um, the case law, I'm going to be discussing it per topic. So I'm going to give you the structure of the act and then each time as we're discussing a particular um, provision in the Act, I'm going to be bringing in the case law as it's um, as it applies or as it's commented or interpreted those provisions. Just a final reminder to all of you to turn off your microphone. I hear a little bit of scratching and papers shuffling in the background. <laughs> um, if you can all just make sure that the little microphone on the on the bar at the bottom of your screen um, has got a line through it to indicate that the mic is off. So you need to put your microphone on mute, please. Thank you. <laughs> right, um, in terms of further developments that have happened since my seminars from last year, um, the National Consumer Commission, I'm hearing someone on their mic, please switch off your mics, please, it's really disturbing. Um, Right, so the National Consumer Commission has been investigating Ford um, in respect of those um, self-igniting, sorry, um, those self-igniting uh, engines that they've had. Let me just see whether I can work out. Do we have any indication whose microphone it is that we're hearing? We're hearing a whole conversation from somebody. Door closing. Thank you, that's better. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so the National Consumer Commission has been investigating Ford um, in respect of the, the engines that self-ignite, okay? And you would have uh, read in the newspapers um, the unfortunate uh, situation where, where Mr. Jimmy burnt up in his, in his Ford Cougar. Um, the outcome of the investigation that was that there was a negotiated fine of 35 million. Um, I think 
uh, certain press reports hailed that as a victory for uh, for consumer law enforcement in South Africa. From my side, look, the maximum fine is 10% uh, of turnover. And if you look at Ford's national turnover, 35 million isn't a tenth of that. It's, it's much, much, much less. Um, if you look at Ford's international turnover, then um, the, the act doesn't specify which one uh, we need to refer to, uh, then 35 million is a tiny drop in the bucket. But nevertheless, we, especially at the moment, grateful uh, that the fiscus is receiving 35 million and hoping that they're spending it well. Um, right, so um, what we found with the, with the tribunal rulings, let me at least give you a, a high level comment. Um, is that the tribunal is starting to really show its teeth by imposing uh, those administrative penalties. Um, uh, the maximum penalty is 10% of turnover or um, uh, what's it, a million rand, whichever is the higher, uh, the higher amount. So if it's a, a small supplier, uh, the million rand, otherwise 10% of turnover, that's the maximum uh, penalty that's been imposed or that can be imposed in terms of the act. The actual penalties that have been imposed are around 100,000 Rand, but nevertheless ones that at least help help us as consumer lawyers to be able to persuade suppliers that it's worthwhile complying with the law. Um, most of the penalties have been imposed in situations where there's, there's a default judgment, uh, and in other words, the supplier wasn't, wasn't present. Um, and um, by its very nature, the, the uh, penalties are being imposed on people who are regarded as being first offenders in the sense that it's the first time that they're before the tribunal. Um, I'm sure if, uh, if, if there would be a, a situation where the tribunal uh, had just complained. Subsequent, uh, subsequent to, um, uh, to having imposed a penalty pr previously, then the, the figures are gonna go right, right up. Um, in terms of product recalls, we've, we saw a tinned pilchard's product recall in February. Um, what happens with uh, tinned pilchards is that if there's an uh, error that creeps in uh, at, the, at the stage of the producing of the tins or of the canning process, there's a, there's a lining on the inside of the, of the metal tin. Um, and if that is defective, then the, the very acidic source in which pilchards are, are um, tinned, the tomato, um, tomato and chili as the case may be, um, eats away at the at the lining and as soon as it gets to the to the tin it goes right through and the, uh, the entry of, of, of tiny amounts of, of air or um, uh, spoils the fish on the inside and it can land you in hospital very easily if you eat that spoiled fish and you wouldn't necessarily be able to see if the if the hole is really tiny. So um, there was a, a product recall in respect of, tin, of those tin pilchards. Um, as a supplier, um, for those of our, our clients who are manufacturers, especially of food products, that is a real worst case scenario. So it's a complete disaster. Um, and um, it's worthwhile for us to um, to talk to them about what their, their uh, procedures and preventative measures are in respect of product recall. Okay, so that's section 60 of the Act. Uh, yes. There are various class actions in the pipeline. I hope I imagine that those are working of moving forward quite slowly now that we're in lockdown. Um, there's a, a class action that was. Um, uh, registered where the class was registered already toward the end of 2018, I think, um, where all of the the victims, the people who got sick, and those who and the family members of those who died um, during that listeriosis outbreak that we had from the contaminated polony um, and other sort of processed meat meat products. Um, produced by Tiger Brands uh, um, have joined together to sue Tiger Brands for their damages. Um, it's it's um, class actions of brand new in South Africa. I think that's the fifth one that's happening in the country. Um, uh, Richard Spoor and LHL attorneys are joining together and they've, they've brought in another law firm, uh, I think a Canadian one that specializes in class actions on behalf of consumers. 
um, to, to uh, continue with that. And they were considering the same team, uh, or at least the LHL, were considering bringing a class action in respect of the um, emissions uh, scandal um, of, of Volkswagen. I don't know whether you know uh, all about that. Um, Sorry, let me make this a bit bigger for you. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Volkswagen uh, had, was caught out in um, the US or, or Europe, I think it was in Europe, that they had, um, the US, um, that they had fudged their emissions, <laughs> or let's say lied about their emissions, and that in fact, um, the fabulous emission standards, low, wonderful low emission standards were, uh, were, were complete fabrication. Um, that obviously brings down the value of a Volkswagen if you thought that you were buying this beautiful clean vehicle, uh, ecologically friendly, etc. I don't know to what extent that influences uh, buying in South Africa, but certainly the Americans care about that sort of thing, I think maybe a bit more than we do and the Europeans certainly much more than we do. So um, that's another class action which is somewhere in the pipeline and may or may not be going ahead, um, but a really interesting one I thought. Um, I am at the moment uh, preparing a test case um, against um, a timeshare uh, service provider, timeshare company. Um, on behalf of, oh, I've been approached by about 500 timeshare clients altogether um, across the various timeshare companies. Um, part of, of the frustration in the timeshare industry and, and uh, is that there was a report issued by the or commissioned, let's call it like, uh, yeah, more accurately, commissioned by the National Consumer Commission um, two years back. The report was scathing about the practices about the time uh, of, of the timeshare industry and made uh, three dozen, as close as them, to three dozen um, recommendations uh, to government in terms of how they could uh, improve matters. Part of it was redrafting the legislation that obviously is a slow process. Um, but also various things like reporting the industry to the uh, Competition Commission for investigation um, and a hundred other uh, variety of, 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 of interventions, um, most of which sound like a very good idea to me. Um, as far as I can tell, not a single one of those have been implemented, which has been a real disappointment, but I'm hoping that my test case will will go some way toward uh, restoring justice to timeshare uh, consumers who've been tremendously disgruntled. Um, the issue there is that timeshare is purchased um, uh, in perpetuity and uh, most consumers don't realize that the situation changes and they can't get out of the contract. You, you have to keep on paying. You immigrate, you can't ever use the timeshare, you have to keep on paying. Um, uh, so that's part of the part of the issue. Um, the agreements also don't comply with legislation, and we feel that we uh, can make out a good case for the agreements being void, ab initio, or at least voidable, um, in the case of those that are credit agreements. And um, what we're going to be asking the court is to return the money that the timeshare consumers have um, have paid for their timeshare over the years. Most of them haven't been able to make it to, to get a lot of bookings. Obviously, we the value that they have received needs to be deducted from the, the payback. Um, but in many cases, they can get the full amount back because they've never managed to get a booking. So um, the whole thing is something verging on, on, on a type of scam. Right. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the difficult and convoluted area of when the Consumer Protection Act applies. For those of you who were able to attend yesterday, um, you, you have covered this and um, I'm regarding it as a bit of light revision for myself as well as for you because this area is so difficult that revisiting it, to my mind, is, is always helpful and useful. So, the CPA applies subject to the exemptions on the next slide to the promotion of goods or services or the promotion of the supplier if that happens in South Africa, except where those goods or services could not be reasonably the subject, couldn't reasonably be the subject of a transaction in South Africa. 
Um, yesterday, we had a whole discussion about when a transaction actually occurs in South Africa um, in the context of the, um, of the of, of travel agencies and their relationships with their clients, foreign and local, um, in respect of services to be rendered in South Africa and outside South Africa, so a whole complicated area there. Then, so the CPA applies to promotion of goods and services, but also to a transaction that occurs in South Africa concerning the supply of goods and services. And um, we're going to be looking at transaction again a little bit today, but especially um, looking at the definition of goods and services and what the case law says about that. Then the goods and services themselves are also governed by the Act irrespective of whether they are offered in conjunction with other goods and services or separately, the CPA applies. Doesn't matter whether the goods or services are second hand, doesn't matter whether they um, are uh, sold at a, at a factory shop or as seconds or anything like that, the CPA applies to all goods and services. And the scary thing with goods, if you're a goods manufacturer, is that you um, supply the goods to a consumer in beautiful packaging that gives a whole lot of warnings and instructions to the consumer um, about the proper use of the goods, et cetera, et cetera. But the moment the first owner of the uh, goods has, has torn off the packaging and starts using the goods, um, all of that information is lost to them. One doesn't know how seriously consumers take that sort of thing. And then if the goods are ungifted or even abandoned and then uh, taken up by another consumer, um, taken into their possession and used again. The CPA continues applying to the goods all the way through the lifetime of the goods, even once they're in several, um, several pieces uh, and lying on a rubbish heap. So that's the, the, the scariness of the application of the act. Okay, here are the exemptions again. So when the consumer is the state or a juristic person, then the CPA doesn't fully apply. Only sections 60 and 61 of the CPA will apply. Okay. Where the supplier is the state or a juristic person, the CPA can still apply. Okay. So remember, this exemption is only in respect of the consumer. So, um, uh, yeah, in respect of juristic persons, I mentioned yesterday that a juristic person is defined in the Act um, in, a, in a manner which is actually counterintuitive for us who know South African common law. So it includes things like trusts, associations, um, et cetera, that are, are not in fact actual juristic persons in terms of our common law understanding. Which juristic persons are excluded from the full uh, application of the Act, a juristic person with an annual turnover for the last financial year of over 2 million rand or an asset value of over 2 million rand at the time of the transaction. Now, the time of the transaction, when is that? Well, it's obviously the time that you conclude the contract with the consumer. It doesn't have to be a, a, a written contract, it can be a verbal or even a, a, an implied contract. But at the time of, of this entering into the contract, the juristic person's turnover and asset value must be under 2 million rand in order for them to be fully protected by the CPA. But remember, things can change over the relationship, of the course of a relationship if you have a long-term relationship with a consumer. Um, and if they start off over the 2 million rand, you relax because the CPA doesn't apply except for section 61 and you hope that you won't provide them with defective goods or service, well, defective goods and um, you, you think you're okay. If their asset value and annual turnover then slips below the 2 million rand mark, then you need to start fully complying with the CPA again. So please be very careful. It's at the time of the transaction and as you saw from the definition of transaction yesterday, transaction encompasses not just the time that you enter into the contract, but the entire period during which you are supplying goods or services to that juristic person as a supplier. Okay, then with credit agreement, um, we um, the goods or services are still subject to the Act, but the actual agreement is not subject to the Act. 
Um, and here I need to refer you to two of the cases. I'm going to ask for your indulgence um, today. I'm referring to so many different cases and I'm going to have to read some stuff off the, <laughs> the judgments. I'm trying to give you absolute chapter and verse um, so that you have it 100% uh, um, accurately. Um, but um, but I'm shuffling 14 uh, printouts on this side. So uh, if it goes a little bit slower and it doesn't sound quite as rehearsed as I would love, to, love it to be, please bear with me. It's the first time I'm doing this seminar. OK, so I want to refer you to, with regard to this credit agreement issue, to the Ponono case. Um, it's on your list of, of judgments that will or have been emailed to you. Um, please check your inbox and also check your junk mail if it isn't in your inbox um, in case it's slipped in there by mistake. So the Ponono, uh, is, uh, Ponono case is um, uh, uh, Mr. Lulamile uh, Ponono versus the Motor Finance Corporation, MFC, the uh, entity which finances motor vehicles. Um, and um, the, um, the judgment has got a comment. Unfortunately, it's obiter um, that um, that refers to uh, to the issue of the um, the transaction being a credit agreement. So the background of the matter is that Mr. Ponono uh, purchased a second-hand vehicle, which was financed by MFC. Um, there was a defect and the dispute landed up before the um, Eastern Cape High Court in Utata. The judgment says in this obiter note, um, in terms of section 5.2D of the CPA, the transaction that uh, the transaction that constitutes a credit agreement under the provisions of the National Credit Act are excluded from the provisions of the CPA. The, um, the sentence doesn't make beautiful sense, but I'm reading it to you verbatim from the judgment. So a credit agreement under the provisions of the National Credit Act are excluded from the provisions of the CPA. The goods and services that are subject to the transaction however, are not excluded. And then the judge gives an, an interpretation, which I find quite interesting. The object of Section 52D of the CPA is to distinguish the position of a credit provider from that of a supplier. Further, it is to protect the contractual rights of a credit provider. So that's quite an interesting idea to me. The purpose of the CPA is really to protect vulnerable consumers rather than suppliers. And credit providers are not really vulnerable in any way that I can see in the normal sense. So um, if, I, if you had to ask my, my view on this, um, I would humbly disagree with a, the with a, a view of the judge here. Yeah, it's a, just an over to comment. But um, to my mind, um, the purpose of, of excluding the credit agreement uh, from the ambit of the CPA is, is not, to, not to help the credit providers, but to rather make sure that they're not over-regulated in the sense of um, credit agreements being subject to the CPA as well as the National Credit Act at the same time, and that leading to confusion uh, uh, in, in, in the minds of consumers <laughs> as opposed to um, benefiting uh, credit providers. But anyway, that's what Ponono says with regard to Section 52D on, on credit agreements. Let's also take a quick look at Van Veik. Van Veik is a really, it's got really interesting facts. Um, uh, the judgment pertains to the position of, of uh, Mr. Van Veik, um, who lives in Mossel Bay and runs a skydiving business. Um, he arranged with UPS, um, the, the courier company, the South African courier company, uh, or the South African branch of the international courier company to transport an item which is described at least by the plaintiff as an aircraft engine from the USA where it had been uh, repaired or uh, rejigged in some sort of a way, um, uh, all the way back to, to George. Um, en route, the 
um, this uh, aircraft engine gets destroyed. Um, and um, just by way of context, there was an indemnity in a credit agreement that um, that Mr. Van Vaak entered into with UPS in the context of instructing them to uh, to do the transporting or the couriering of this uh, of this engine for him. Um, what does the what does the judgment say about it being a credit agreement and the relevance of that? Um, quite an really quite an interesting approach. Um, the judge says the defendant submitted that the provisions of the CPA are not applicable in this case because this agreement concluded between the parties constitutes a credit agreement under the National Credit Act, the NCA, in terms of Section 52D of the CPA, and then he, he quotes it. Um, in my view, this submission has no merit because the second portion of Section 52D of the CPA states that but that the goods and services that are the subject of the credit agreement are not excluded from the ambit of this act. And this is self-explanatory. Clearly what was expected of the defendant, even though in terms of a credit agreement was the supply of a service, which is not excluded from the ambit of the CPA. And then the judge goes on to, uh, to apply the CPA. So you can see um, that this carve out in respect of the goods or services um, actually has a has a major um, can have a major practical effect. We're going to come back. We're going to circle back to Van Vaak versus versus UPS um, uh, as we as we continue uh, with the seminar. And I'll give you a few more of the facts as we go along. But I just wanted to um, bring you up to speed on credit agreements as we go along. Right. Then the further exemption from the application is services supplied by an employee. Um, and for those of you who are employees providing services to your, um, to your employer, I'm sure you're very grateful that you don't need to comply with a CPA in respect of those. The crazy thing is that you still need to comply with the requirements of, of well, that you still um, have a, a no fault liability if you provide goods that are um, defective to your boss, um, and they and they um, run into harm and damage damages as a result of that. They can claim their damages from you on a no fault basis, and um, that's in terms of the red exception to the exemption, which is at the bottom of the slide. And we've we've spoken about the other exemptions, um, and I'm going to continue on. We also discussed yesterday the specific inclusion, inclusions, franchise activities, and the supply of goods or services by a, a collectivity such as a club, trade union, association, um, uh, and, and what's relevant in our context now, um, churches, charitable organizations, NGOs. Um, the CPA applies to um, the supply of goods or services by this collectivity, but only if the goods or services are supplied to their members. So if you have a, a, a query or, a, or a, um, an instruction from an NGO at this time, maybe someone pro uh, providing food um, uh, or other social help in this time of great need in, in, in our country, it's only if that NGO is providing uh, the goods, let's say the food, to its members. Okay, and remember, if they're an association, the constitution will list who the members are. Um, so if there's food being provided to school kids or to general members of the public, it's unlikely that those would be members of the collectivity. And then the CPA isn't specifically uh, triggered by the specific inclusion. So um, uh, the, the issue then is whether it's a, a transaction and transactions, as you know from yesterday, need to be for consideration. If it's a, a free of charge um, supply of food um, or other services to uh, to those in need, then the CPA will not apply to that um, relationship or that uh, supply. Okay. Right. Sorry. Okay. 
let's go back to the definition of transaction. As we discussed yesterday, transaction is the, the central definition in, in this act. And if you know what a transaction is and you can apply that, then you're almost halfway with applying the CPA. So um, I think I briefly mentioned Mr. Ratton's case yesterday. Let me give you chapter and verse on that now, um, as soon as I can find it. So you'll recall that um, this case relates to a um, consumer who handed in his uh, Land Rover to a dealership or a, a garage to have it repaired. And for the time that he was without his vehicle, he was given a um, Land Rover to drive, uh, which in fact belonged to a company called Four Wheel Drive Accessory Distributors CC, sorry, a CC. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Ratton is driving this vehicle um, uh, about four or five days after his, his uh, Landy went in, it's still in the garage, um, when unknown assailants shoot and kill Mr. Ratton and, and dramatically uh, damage the, um, uh, the Land Rover, obviously with bullet holes all over, and Mr. Ratton obviously in the process uh, loses control and the, and the car crashes. Um, Four-wheel drive, the owner of the vehicle now wants to hold Mr. Ratton's estate and um, the, uh, the uh, respondent in this in the SEA matter, which I'm referring to, is uh, Mr. Ratton's executrix. Um, so he wants to hold the estate liable for the damage to the um, to the uh, four by four. Okay, um, the SEA. Well, let me first tell you about the finding in the in the court of quo. Um, it's a KZN judgment, high court judgment, um, and uh, Judge Pillay there found that the contract between Mr. Ratton and Four Wheel Drive it was a standard form contract um, with uh, quite a few provisions, a uh, bit like the sorts of things that you sign when you're renting a car, you know, where they show you just sign here, 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 and then your full signature at the end. Okay, here are your keys. Um, uh, it had a provision in there that required Mr. Ratton not to pay for the uh, the use of or the rental or whatever of the um, uh, courtesy vehicle, but, um, but in fact to ensure it um, from, I think it was the fourth day that he was driving it. So by the time that he was that he was um, deceased and driving his, the, 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 this vehicle, he should have insured it under his own name in terms of that little contract. Um, Judge Pillay wasn't very happy with the contract. She found that it contravened the uh, CPA. It wasn't um, compliant with Section 22 in the sense that it needed to be in plain language, etc. Um, she says that um, even four-wheel drives uh, representative couldn't explain properly what it meant. So how on earth could a consumer expect, be expected to know what it meant? She basically sets aside the entire agreement based on the CPA. Um, and it's that judgment that has now been appealed to the SEA. The SEA finds that the provision of a courtesy car um, in this situation to the deceased was not an agreement for all the supply of goods or services or the performance of services at the direction of a consumer. So um, here's the definition of transaction. So as you'll recall, a transaction is either the agreement, the actual supply of goods or services, and then those two specific inclusions with it in respect of the collectivity and the franchises. Okay. However, the, the SEA now finds that this courtesy car was not an agreement for the supply of goods or services or the supply of goods or services or the performance of services at the direction of a consumer. The agreement did not constitute a transaction between the supplier and consumer as contemplated in Section 5.6 of the Act. The deceased gave nothing of value and the plaintiff accepted nothing in exchange for the use of the Land Rover discovery. So on the plain wording of the relevant provisions, there was no consideration and therefore no transaction as envisaged in the Act. Nevertheless, the appeal is dismissed because the plaintiff couldn't 
prove locus standi. So I think uh, a good outcome for the uh, for the for the right in the estate in the sense that they weren't burdened with the repair costs on account of the of a, of a technicality, but nevertheless clarity in our law that where there isn't a supply of goods or services for consideration, as is referred to in the transaction, there um, the CPA will not in fact apply. Okay, so careful they, um, the 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 SEA as you know, really digs into the exact wording. So here, the second bullet point, the actual supply of goods or services to or at the direction of a consumer for consideration is required. Now here, there was an actual supply of goods, right? The vehicle was supplied to Mr. Ratton, uh, or maybe one could regard it as a service in the sense of him being given access to the vehicle in order to drive it for the period. Okay, so goods or services, but that supply was given at the direction of not Mr. Ratton, not the consumer, but in fact of the um, another supplier, the uh, Land Rover uh, garage, which was repairing his vehicle. And yes, they, they may have paid consideration, but Mr. Ratton did not. So because it wasn't at the direction of Mr. Ratton, uh, that's, um, we're going to talk about consideration a little bit further because I'm not sure that the SEA got this right. Um, but certainly it's not a transaction as defined on the ipsissima verba um, of the definition of transaction. Okay. Let's take a look at the definition of consumer. And here I want to refer you to um, the Westeisen judgment. Also a very interesting set of facts, um, but let me, let's just cover the, the definition first and then we'll, get, we'll dig into the facts. A consumer includes not only a person to whom goods or services are promoted, um, but also a, uh, the person Sorry, not only person to whom goods are supplied, but also the person to whom goods are promoted. As long as it happens in the ordinary course of the supplier's business. Um, and uh, it also encompasses a person who's entered into a transaction with a supplier, as long as the supplier is acting in the ordinary course of their business. Unless the consumer is over the threshold or the transaction is exempt. So we've spoken about the threshold. That's where the consumer is a juristic person and the turnover for the last financial year or the asset value is over 2 million rand um, or where the transaction is exempt and there are four or five, uh, five or six, seven or eight <laughs> different exemptions that we've just covered on the uh, previous slide. Right. Um, included in the definition of consumer is also a user of goods or a recipient or beneficiary of services, even where there's no contractual nexus between the user or recipient or beneficiary um, and the supplier. Right, so let me give you the, uh, the facts of Westhausen versus Puma Energy South Africa. You'll find it on your list. Um, Mrs. Oersteisen, Mrs. Gatreide Magdalena Oersteisen, trading as Wilger Motors, is the is the applicant in the in the um, case. It's a matter in the High Court in Bloemfontein. Um, Mrs. Oersteisen is. Um, is a is a, a long-term banker. She worked uh, worked for a bank for 30 years, um, and then when her husband died, he had run the the uh, Volker Motors, the um, the filling station, and um, and and she then took over his business after his death. Okay, so she is in this situation the consumer, and she's an individual, a natural person trading as Wilhelm Motors. Okay, the cardinal question in this application is whether the applicant, a trader in the name and style of Wilhelm Motors, a retail outlet which on sells fuel, which has been delivered to it by the first respondent, that's Puma Energy South Africa, 
is a manufacturer of petroleum products. Sorry, they are the manufacturer of petroleum products. And the question is whether Mrs. Westhausen is a consumer in terms of the Consumer Protection Act and entitled to the protection in that act. Okay, let's give a little bit of background. Um, there's a, a, an agreement that was entered into between Puma and Wilger Motors, which contains an arbitration clause. A dispute arose between the parties and um, uh, Puma relied on the arbitration clause in order to force an arbitration with, with Mrs. Westeisen. An arbitration clause is presumed to be an unfair contract term uh, in terms of the um, grey list in uh, regulation 44, um, which is read with section 48 of the CPA that deals with fair, reasonable and just contract terms. Okay, so Mrs. Westazen was trying to rely on all of this law in terms of the CPA in order to wriggle out of the arbitration, and that's what the case is about. Okay, so um, I won't give you all of the um, all of the detail in terms of the dispute. What we're interested in here is what whether Mrs. Westazen is uh, a consumer or not. The court finds. Uh, on the evidence that vis-a-vis -vis the first respondent, in other words, Puma, um, uh, the applicant was not a consumer, but a retailer, okay? So they say Mrs. Westhausen is a retailer. So if we look at the supply chain, there's a manufacturer, that's Puma, they supply the fuel to, to Mrs. Westhausen, she retails it to end consumers, you and me, as we draw into uh, Volker Motors and fill up our vehicle. Okay. Um, the judge also finds that the applicant was not utilizing the fuel product as a consumer, but as a retailer. It goes without saying that no two persons can, can be both a retailer and a consumer at the same time in terms of the CPA. The first respondent pointed out correctly that the relationship as reflected in the dealer agreement was a business-to-business -business agreement and not a business-to-consumer relationship. The consumer must be a natural person. So I want to ask you, what do you make of this? Um, I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, it's very clear from the, from the act that a consumer can be a juristic person, not a natural person, because remember those exemptions <laughs> that speak about it juristic persons with a turnover of uh, over or under 2 million um, are also covered by the CPA, whether wholly or, or partially. So I think maybe the learner judge got uh, got things by the, by the tail end uh, in respect of this. The way that I see it is that you can have um, a relationship where you wear two hats, okay? And that's often the case in respect of a, of a supply chain like this. So the manufacturer um, supplies the fuel to the um, to the garage in their relationship with the manufacturer. They are the consumer, okay? And they're not even a juristic person. It's Mrs. Westhausen. She's an individual. So to my mind, she should be fully uh, covered as a consumer. Um, she is a person who has entered into a transaction with a supplier in the ordinary course of the supplier's business, okay? Because she's an individual, it's irrelevant whether she's over the threshold and the transaction isn't exempt. So she's also a, a, a user uh, and recipient and beneficiary of the fuel um, and various other services that are provided um, by, the, by the supplier of the fuel, delivery services, etc. Filling up of pumps and that sort of thing. Um, and it is perfectly possible for one person to be both a retailer and a consumer because in a relationship with you and me, when we pull into the um, garage to, uh, to fill up, um, uh, she is the retailer and we are the consumer. Um, and once again, the consumer doesn't have to be a natural person. You can drive in with a car owned by your trust and fill up and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> that's a juristic person for purposes of the CPA. Okay. Nevertheless, um, that's the that's the finding in respect of uh, the, the issue of of whether um, 
a consumer can extend to a, a natural person uh, trading as a, a, a filling station. The judgment continues a little bit further on um, to say Mrs. Westhazen cannot cl claim to be in the same boat as vulnerable consumers seeking protection from unconscionable, false, misleading or deceptive conduct. And um, the judge finds that the application must fail. Um, we're going to be revisiting it in respect of section 40, sorry, regulation 44 and section 48 in a little while, and I'll give you the information on that then. Okay, let's, let's uh, zoom in on uh, the definition of goods. And once we've finished with goods, we probably will have a chance for a little break. Um, goods, as we mentioned yesterday, include anything marketed for human consumption, any other tangible object, including a medium on which anything is written or encoded, um, all of the intangibles, literature, music, photograph, motion picture, game, information, data, software, code, or other intangibles, a legal interest in land or other immovable property, except for an interest within the definition of service. And we discussed yesterday, uh, just uh, quickly, um, which uh, legal interests in land we think would go under service and which ones would fall under a legal interest in land, uh, which is a good. Okay, the utilities are included and, um, and, and this isn't a numerous classes, it's, a, um, it's an open list. So it's, it's, you'll see that the definition says goods includes anything marketed for, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The case that I want to discuss here, we're just getting a very small point out of um, that deals with the definition of goods in quite an interesting um, context. It's a matter between the motor industry ombud of South Africa um, and uh, the um, respondent in the matter is Silver Park Motors. Um, the motor industry um, Ombud is entitled to a contribution from all of the, everyone who's registered with them. So if you're a motor dealership, um, you need to register with Myosa and that's how they fund their operations. Silver Park Motors is a seller of car fuels and lubricants. And the issue in this um, Supreme Court of Appeal case is whether they should have registered with Myosa or not. Um, and the, the, the question there is whether they are a seller of goods as defined in terms of the CPA. So how, does the, how do the judges deal with it? It's, um, they say, um, I'm, I'm quoting for you from the, from the uh, various judgments. So I'm reading them verbatim. I hope that's, that's more helpful than, than giving a paraphrase. The judges say the starting point is section two of the act, that's the CPA. It provides that the act must be interpreted in a manner that gives effect to its purposes set out in section three. These include promoting and advancing the social and economic welfare of com consumers in the country by, amongst others, promoting fair business practices and pro protecting consumers from unconscionable unfair and improper trade practices and deceptive, misleading, unfair or fraudulent conduct. Okay, so that's the starting point. You'll see in many, if you read the full judgment, you'll see in many of the judgments, the, the judge starts by looking at the purpose of the act, starting with a purpose of in interpretation and then launches into the application of the act. The judges eventually get to the term goods. Um, and what do they say about that? The term goods includes anything marketed for human consumption and any tangible object not otherwise contemplated in paragraph A. And they find that this includes automotive fuel and lubricants. <laughs> okay. So um, the issue uh, that that uh, is being addressed here is that um, Myosa are saying, the motor industry ombud is saying, you're selling fuel and lubricants, that's an accessory in terms of the motor trade, and consequently you must register with us and pay us your, uh, your, your annual fee. Um, 
Silver Park Motors come back and say, no, um, the purpose of, of um, uh, this registration and the, the code um, that governs the ombud is to protect consumers and to make sure that consumers are protected who wouldn't otherwise be, be protected. But our consumers are fully protected in terms of the Consumer um, Protection Act and the Consumer Goods and Services Ombud. And if you fall under another ombuds ambit, then you don't need to register with my OSA as well. They say, consumers indeed have a remedy and are entitled to lodge a complaint with the Office of the Consumer Goods and Services Ombud in cases where rogue or dishonest fuel retailers sell substandard products to them. Consequently, the appeal is dismissed with costs. So definition of goods, we see that um, Fuel, automotive fuel and lubricants uh, are regarded as an example of anything marketed for human consumption and any tangible object not otherwise contemplated. Okay. Ah. There's another reference in the Ponono case. To, um, to the definition of goods. Okay, sorry, this is an error. Please um, please just take out Ponono versus MFC. I'm, I'll talk to you about Ponono again under services. We'll get there in a moment. Okay, services, any work or undertaking performed by one person for the direct or indirect. Um, benefit of another. I think I'm going to quickly cover services as well um, and then we'll take our break. I, I see that it's not quite 11 o'clock yet. Um, services encompasses the provision of access to or use of any premises for rental as well as the right of occupancy or a similar right to land not in terms of rent as well as the provision of education, information, advice or consultation except where that is governed by the phase act and remember as we discussed yesterday um financial services board legislation is excluded from the ambit of the cpa as i've mentioned here at the bottom so banking services in principle included under services but then most of those are excluded again under the financial services legislation exemption that came out just after the CPA. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about supply as soon as I've given you a chance to uh, to grab a cup of, of, of tea or coffee. Um, I am, um, yeah, it looks like it's about 11 o'clock on my watch. Um, let's meet again at 11.05. See you then. I thought you gave it to me. We have that uh, seminar, but they took a break. Everything all right? Yeah. 
to Heil Ibrahim, your microphone is on. Please mute to Heil Ibrahim. Your microphone is on. Please mute. Yeah. Don't be outside too much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. About uh, half past twelve. Very few people. Oh, no. Alright. Correct, no? Please take uh, and please tell me everything. Right.
Right, let's resume. So in respect of services, sorry, let's talk about suppliers first. When used as a verb, um, supply means to sell, rent, uh, exchange and hire goods, as long as that is in the ordinary course of business and for consideration. Um, and then in the context of services, supply means to sell the services, to perform the services, or to subcontract the services. Okay. It also includes granting access to any premises, any event, activity, or facility in the ordinary course of business and for consideration. So a supplier is defined as a person who promotes or supplies any goods or services. And... Um, You'll see that to me is the one uh, definition that we really wanted some um, some some jurisprudence on, um, because I want to know whether an estate agent is the supplier of the property or not. <laughs> um, that's the topic of of um, two of the two of the cases that are very slowly working their way towards uh, on behalf of my clients towards the. Um, uh, the, the um, High Court in Cape Town, but anyway, I'll report back on those as soon as I am able to. Consideration, we circle back to four-wheel drive versus Rattan, but let's just look at the definition first. Um, I think in my previous seminars, I always used to say that um, the definition of consideration wins the, wins the prize for the broadest definition in, in legislation that I've ever encountered. Anything of value given and accepted in exchange for goods or services, including money, property, a negotiable instrument, credit, in other words, a credit um, barter, in other words, the goods that you would barter in exchange for those goods or services, a loyalty credit, a right to assert a claim, or any other thing undertaking, promise, agreement, or assurance, irrespective of its value, whether transferred directly or indirectly, or involves the supplier and consumer only, or third parties as well. Now, with four-wheel drive versus Rattan, remember that's the case that deals with a courtesy vehicle. So Mr. Rattan didn't pay for the courtesy vehicle. Um, he paid for the repairs to his vehicle. Um, uh, to the garage. The garage in turn would have paid for wheel drive, but there's no evidence um, on that in, uh, before the courts. Um, at least that's that's discussed in either of the two judgments, the court of quo or the SEA judgment. Um, to my mind, if you have to decide in the case of a courtesy vehicle like Mr. Rattan's, was consideration given? And maybe I should ask you just to consider that. Um, if you like, post your answer in the in the chat function and we can see who, who guessed it right or who agrees with me and who agrees with the SEA and <laughs> whether the two are the same or different. Um, yeah. So to my mind, I would say there was money, which is something of value, uh, given and accepted in exchange for the goods or services provided to Mr. Ratton by the garage, and that's a third party, if you look at the little proviso at the end, and it wasn't transferred directly from Mr. Ratton, but indirectly um, he was financing with the payment that he made to the garage, um, their, uh, you know, financing their uh, payment to, to four-wheel drive. A small portion of that was to pay for the courtesy vehicle indirectly. And it didn't only invo involve four-wheel drive, the supplier and Mr. Ratton, but a third party as well, the, the garage. So my interpretation is that the, the definition is broad enough. Um, where the um, court of quo managed to sort of hook um, 
the the uh, facts to uh, the definition of consideration in the in the um, Natal High Court um, was that they said that the undertaking. So if you look at the fourth bullet point there, any other thing undertaking promise, agreement or assurance that the obligation on Mr. Ratton in terms of that little contract that he signed to ensure the vehicle once he'd been driving it for four days um, was the undertaking which was given in exchange for the goods or services that were provided and that that was sufficient to trigger um, a compliance with the requirement of, of consideration. Let's take a look at what the ECA says about that. Just find four wheel drive again. They start off by saying it's not a transaction and there I agree, but then they continue to say the deceased gave nothing of value and the plaintiff, in other words, four wheel drive the supply of the vehicle, um, accepted nothing in exchange for the use of the discovery. So on the plain wording of the relevant provisions, there was no consideration and thus no trans transaction as envisaged in the act. So I agree that there was no transaction and that the CPA doesn't apply for that reason. But I think I'm with the quarter quo as well as my thought about the indirect payment from the um, uh, from the garage, and I'm, I'm not really with the uh, ACA. Nevertheless, this is the precedent that we have in our law. So careful uh, with your interpretation of consideration. It looks as though uh, the ACA inclines to narrow things down uh, more so than the wording of the Act um, does. Right. Um, I've, I've already read to you and you'll find um, when I quote from uh, from the, the other 14 uh, judgments that I haven't discussed yet or the balance of the, I think there are about nine that I haven't discussed yet with you, that so many of the um, judgments follow the starting point of looking at the interpretation provisions in the CPA and, and rightly so. So, what are the interpretation provisions? I didn't discuss these with you yesterday, so let's quickly run through uh, through all of this so that you have your bearings. Um, the CPA says that uh, any court or tribunal must develop the common law to improve consumer rights. Um, so it's not just a question of referring to the common law. It's not just a question of applying the common law um, as uh, section two, subsection 10, joins us in parallel with the consumer rights. So consumer has uh, all of their common law rights as well as all of their CPA rights and all of those apply simultaneously. Um, now on top of that, uh, section four of the act says that um, a, a tribunal or court must even develop the common law to improve consumer rights. Then it goes on to say that the court must regard um, the findings of a consumer court when ombud um, and um, when they are reaching their, their decision um, in interpreting the CPA. So th this is a very strange provision because a consumer court is a little office where in some cases they, they have hearings, but most of the time they just really um, engage with with complainants and um, suppliers in order to try and reach uh, a sort of a mediated settlement between the two. Um, and in many cases, they don't actually give findings or rulings. Um, they resort under the, the provincial government of, of various of our provinces, and many of our provinces don't even have consumer courts. So it's not a proper court, it's like a little tribunal. Okay. We're finding that some people haven't switched off their mic. Can you can you just make sure I, I, I'm sure you can all hear that there's a bit of interference. Thanks very much. OK, um, so the court is supposed to look at these consumer court findings and the, the findings of, of the consumer goods and services on board and the motor industry on board. Both of those, honestly, to my mind, I'd rather have a judge pronounced than the on board. Um, but nevertheless, that's what the Act says. 
Bizarrely, there isn't a reference to the findings of the National Consumer Tribunal, which is the main adjudicator that's set up or referred to in terms of the CPA and, and is, is specifically enjoined with interpreting and applying um, the Consumer Protection Act as well as the National Credit Act. So quite, uh, quite a strange omission here. As you know, and, and as I've mentioned a little bit earlier, the tribunal's findings don't create precedent, but honestly, neither do consumer court findings or ombud findings. So quite a, a, a strange provision here, but hopefully you can find it um, useful uh, before a, when you're dealing with a matter in, in future. Okay. Hello. Then Act says that with any ambiguous provision of the Act, that it must be interpreted according to the spirit of the Act. Um, and um, if we're trying to work out whether something is ambiguous, we're going to be talking about Section 69 quite a bit in the course of today's seminar, because Section 69 is such a troublesome provision and it's been pronounced on uh, several times in the last year. Um, unfortunately, in a contradictory manner, if you if you look at the various judgments, but let's um, let's cross that bridge as we as we get there. Section 69, to my mind, is a classic example of an ambiguous provision, or at least a, a provision that we would very much like to be ambiguous if possible. Um, unfortunately, the Joe Roy case, the first judgment that really pronounced on the interpretation and application of Section 69, made it very clear that the judge found it not ambiguous. So unfortunately, we can't say that we can interpret it in some way, which is according to the spirit of that, um, whatever that means exactly. Okay, then um, Section 4, subsection 5 says that supplier contracts and documents have to be interpreted contra preferentum and that you can't exclude the contra preferentum rule. Um, let's, for those of you who um, haven't been to the university for a, for a few years like me, maybe I can just remind us of the contra preferentum rule or maybe those of us who don't do contractual drafting all the time. The contra preferentum rule, which is a challenge for seminar presenters all over <laughs> tongue twister, um, is a rule which says that, an, that where a contract is um, ambiguous, it needs to be interpreted against the interests of the drafter or the uh, of the of the contract or the person on whose behalf the contract was drafted. So let's say your attorney drafts the contract and it's unclear and there are two interpretations that we can place on a particular section, we're going to pick the one that is against your interests because your attorney drafted it. Okay, that's the contra preferentum rule. So what all uh, solid commercial drafters do is to say somewhere in the uh, in those um, boilerplate provisions that we include somewhere in the contract, it's not just to, to puff up the contract and make it look longer so that you can charge more money for it. You also exclude the contra preferentum rule so that your client isn't disadvantaged if you have drafted something which afterwards turns out to be um, uh, ambiguous um, and open to various interpretations. Okay, so however, in the context of the CPA now, so where a contract is governed by the CPA, you can't exclude the contra preferentum rule and it's always going to be interpreted against the interest of the, usually the supplier, right, who's drafted that contract. Okay, then a terribly far-reaching, and, and, and here that's, um, I'm stealing a word from uh, Nudia and Iceland, the drafters of the um, commentary on the CPA. I mentioned yesterday that that really is the authoritative um, uh, docu or, yeah, um, um, book that you can, or it's a, a loosely volume that you can refer to in terms of interpretation. There's also a good textbook by um, Elizabeth de Sadler. I think hers is the best. There are some others, but mainly they just regurgitate what the Act says. Um, uh, in the commentary, they say that this provision is far reaching. It's section um, four, subsection five. It says that any contractual limitation, so let's say there's a provision that limits a consumer's rights in your contract. It's only valid to the extent that a consumer could have expected to have seen this limitation in that type of contract. And um, 
That means, remember, consumers are not the same as attorneys. They don't have the same expectations in terms of contracts. Um, to my mind, this may well limit the sorts of things that we can um, put in, con in, in consumer contracts very, very dramatically. Okay. Right, so um, previous slide was uh, section four of the Act. Section two of the Act um, says that we need to interpret the CPA in a purposive manner, and that's the same way that the Constitution needs to be interpreted. Um, we must give effect to its purposes. Now, what are the purposes of the Act? Those are set out in section three, and there's a little bit in the, in the preamble as well. Um, it, section three, let me read, read the beginning of it to you. The purposes of this Act are to promote and advance the social and economic welfare of consumers in South Africa by establishing a legal framework for the achievement and maintenance of a fair, accessible, efficient, sustainable, and responsible uh, consumer market, which is responsible for the benefit of consumers generally. So what we're looking for is a legal framework that will create a fair, accessible, efficient, sustainable um, uh, consumer market. And then secondly, reducing and ameliorating any disadvantages experienced in accessing any supply of goods or services by consumers who are low income persons, persons who live in remote, isolated or low density population areas, minors, um, seniors or other similarly vulnerable consumers, and consumers whose ability to read and, and comprehend any advert agreement um, label, warning, notice, etc., is limited either by low literacy, vision impairment, in other words, a sight problem, or limited fluency in the language, usually English, in which the, the document is, is, is published. And then promoting fair business practices um, and protecting consumers from unconscionable, unfair, unreasonable, unjust, or otherwise improper trade practices, um, deceptive, misleading, unfair, or fraudulent conduct, and then it continues. So you get the picture, right? The purpose of the act is to create a fair market and then to protect vulnerable consumers. Obviously, it goes much broader than that because um, I think all of us who are attending the seminar are consumers and we are not probably not particularly vulnerable consumers uh, in general. Maybe you're a bit more vulnerable if you're interacting with a real giant like um, Microsoft or um, the government of South Africa, but in general, we we fairly well trained and assertive people, um, and and we have some finances behind us as well as legal knowledge. So and and the CPA certainly covers us as well and and protects us. Okay, then there's a provision uh, in section two, subsection eight, which says that um, where uh, the word includes is uses or include is used um, in the context of the CPA. That doesn't limit the list. It doesn't create a closed list. There's no numerous clauses. It, um, it can be, it can include a whole lot of other things that are not specifically listed um, in, in the wording of the section. So let me give you an example. We've just uh, dealt with the uh, definition of goods. Goods includes anything marketed for human consumption, tangibles, intangibles, um, uh, rights to uh, immovable property, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Does that, does that normally mean that it's a numerous clause? Well, not really on the wording, but this clarifies it um, uh, even further. It says, that it's not a closed list and that you can read further examples in there. So we have we already have tremendously broad definitions in the CPA that really extend the ambit of the act um, uh, very dramatically. And this <laughs> just underlines it, double underlines that we can read even further examples into these lists. Okay. Um, we spoke about conflicts with other acts. Um, I'm going to um, talk about misleading consumers and um, focus on, on an interesting case. 
those of you who are whiskey lovers, I'm hoping that I'm not going to bring you to tears by talking about whiskey, but we're going to focus on the legal side of things um, exclusively. Right, so misleading a consumer is really a sort of a light motif right through the CPA. It's um, it, it, it has been the pleasure of the drafter to um, remind us again and again and again in the act that suppliers are not allowed to mislead consumers, deceive them, not, uh, not by omission, not by commission, not in respect of uh, central aspects, uh, material aspects, not in respect of uh, more peripheral aspects, you'll see the various sections deal with all kinds of different permutations. So the different sections are section 45 B and C, section 29, 41, and then in section 51, it also deals with mis misleading consumers. Um, and uh, in each case, that's prohibited. Okay. What are the remedies? Well, if you breach section 41 with its particular wording, then you have... Um, Access to court in terms of section 52, there's a typo in section 41, it says section 51, but it's, it should, should read section 52 and, and it looks as though the judges are accepting that that's correct. Um, uh, certainly in section 52, it refers back to section 41 and section 51 <laughs> doesn't. So if you breach, say, breach section 41, a court may order the, the supplier's entire agreement void or make any other just order. We spoke about section 52 as being a bit of a silver bullet in terms of access to court yesterday. We'll, we'll talk about, about it in a bit less detail today, but with reference to some judgments. Okay, so... What is the uh, what does the case law say with regard to misleading consumers? Um, the Scotch Whiskey Association um, and a few others took Milestone Beverage CC um, and a few others uh, to court, and we we received a judgment in March last year. Um, unfortunately, just a little bit too late. What was published a little bit too late. Um, for me to include in, in last year's seminar. Let me give you just a very quick rundown of the facts. Also quite an interesting set of facts. Um, this is an application based on unlawful competition in the whiskey industry. The premise for the unlawful competition is alleged to be by way of misrepresentation and breach of various statutory provisions namely Section 41 of the Consumer Protection Act, in other words, misleading consumers, um, as well as Sections 11 and 12 of the, of the Liquor Products Act. Um, the first respondent is um, a manufacturer of uh, beverage products, namely Royal Douglas and King Arthur. I don't know whether you've ever come across those. Um, which are said to have get apps misrepresenting to the public that they are whiskey or whiskey, scotch whiskey products. While in fact, they are cane spirit or vodka that is colored to have the appearance of whiskey. <laughs> so now you're quite pleased that you haven't had Royal Douglas or King Arthur up to now. Okay. Secondly, the get apps contain misleading statements and information about the nature and quality of the liquor being sold, in particular that the products are whiskey flavored or are whiskey or are scotch whiskey and contain an alcohol strength of 43.5%, which is about right for whiskey. Um, my husband and I got back from a, a trip to uh, Scotland just before the lockdown started. In fact, on account of having been to Scotland, we were placed in self-isolation. Um, so we were already in isolation when the, when the lockdown regulations kicked in. Anyway, let me um, give you what the what the um, judgment says with regard to uh, these whiskey products. So the correct alcohol um, content for for whiskey is about forty three percent. In fact, the alcohol content of these beverages are thirty four point nine eight percent. Right. So the judgment really concludes. Uh, by quoting um, a judgment, Long, Long John International Limited versus Cinnabosch Wine Trust. You can read it in the, in the judgment if you're interested. It's right at the end. Um, he says that it, 
it follows that the delect, it follows from what I have said that a person who falsely and culpably represents to the public that his products are products of a particular character, composition, or origin known by the public under a descriptive name which has gained a public reputation without passing them off as the product of the plaintiff who produces what may be termed the genuine products and who thereby causes patrimonial loss to the plaintiff, commits the delict of unlawful competition and is liable in damages to the plaintiff. Okay, so what is found here is that although it's not referred to again, that there is a, in fact a breach of section 41, um, uh, as well as an, an, uh, an instance of the delict of unlawful competition. And um, there's quite a dramatic order that's made. All of the whiskey products have to be destroyed, um, all kinds of interdicts in terms of um, never ever representing again that their product is uh, whiskey or whiskey flavored, um, has a 43% alcohol content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so um, right, let's focus on the vexed question of picking a forum for a consumer complaint. We've um, we touched on on this uh, yesterday and we skimmed through the slides so quickly that I think your heads must have been spinning. Let me do a, a proper job of it today. Section 69 of the CPA says that before, and that's the bottom uh, block on the left hand side, before you can approach a court with jurisdiction, you have to exhaust all your other remedies in terms of national legislation, and that includes obviously the CPA remedies. And then a whole lot of them are listed in section 69. So your first court of call is an applicable ombud with jurisdiction. So here I'm thinking, if you have an issue with your dentist, there is an ombud out there um, that deals with dentistry. Um, there's a whole long list of, of, of ombuds with jurisdiction over particular um, types of commerce. And I have listed all of those with their contact details, which I hope really hope are still up to date um, in the material that was circulated to you yesterday. OK, so refer to that as your first port of call. Let's say you can't find an applicable ombud with jurisdiction. Second port of call is to go to a consumer court of the relevant province with jurisdiction. Okay, as I've explained, consumer courts resort under the provincial government and they're a type of tribunal or dispute resolution sort of agency, which usually just does conciliation or mediation to an extent between the supplier and the consumer. That's a remedy you can try to exhaust. I'm not sure, they certainly don't have teeth to um, to really assist with a with a, a serious dispute between consumers and and suppliers. Okay, third port of call. Here we're getting a little bit more um, heavyweight. An applicable industry ombud accredited in terms of the CPA. Now there are two that have been accredited in terms of the CPA, and a third one that's applied for credit accreditation. The main one, of course, the Consumer Goods and Services Ombud. And you can find a huge amount of detail on their website, um, www.cgso.org, I think, .za. And um, they are accredited in terms of the act. And the other one that's been accredited is MIOSA, the Motor Industry Ombud, also accredited. If you had to ask me whether what level of, of confidence I place in their um, ability to reach the right uh, recommendation. I'm really skeptical about the motor industry ombud. So many of my clients come to me with a vehicle dispute where they've been to the ombud and either have waited and waited many months to, to get a, a, a ruling and, and it was never forthcoming or a recommendation. Um, or in other cases, it was patently wrong um, in terms of the provisions of the CPA. So, um, I'm, I, I don't refer clients to Myosa um, unless we've really run out of options. Um, uh, consumer Goods and Services Ombud, I think, is much better. Um, I'm happy with most of what they say um, and, and in, in complete agreement. 
The problem there is that they don't, don't have teeth, so they make a recommendation, and if that's not followed, as is a case, as is really likely to be in the case of a, a proper deep dispute between a consumer and a supplier, then the only thing they can do is to refer the matter to the National Consumer Commission. And honestly, one could have done that yourself. Um, except that the commission <laughs> is not very responsive. Um, right. Then you have the option of, uh, if the, uh, an industry ombud is not applicable, then you have two options. An alternative dispute resolution agent. What's the issue there? Well, the parties have to pay this alternative dispute resolution agent and the consumer and the supplier would have to therefore agree to which agent they're going to use, which rules the agent must follow, um, who will pay, where will the um, uh, dispute resolution take place, etc. If the parties are in a deep dispute, they're not going to be able to reach an uh, arrangement on, on all of those aspects unless you have a, a, a more compliant supplier than the sorts of ones that cross my desk. Um, so that's not a very practical solution. I mean, I'm not uh, knocking ADR, but uh, practically for most of my clients, they find that the supplier is not willing to agree to this um, unless they've got a summons in front of them and they think, OK, mate, wait for a moment, let's rather go to ADR from here. Um, then your, uh, your final option is to file a complaint with the commission. Why do I say that's the final option? There's another block at the bottom. You're allowed to go straight to the tribunal if that's permitted by the Act. Um, now, it is permitted by the Act in certain uh, circumstances after you've exhausted some of the other remedies. Um, practically speaking, I've never encountered anyone who has ever um, fitted the criteria for a direct approach to the tribunal. If I'm trying to get a matter before the tribunal, the approach that I follow is to take it to the commission. The commission almost invariably refers it to the um, to the ombud. Um, from the ombud, it goes back to the commission and then to the tribunal. But what you can do with the commission is to ask them for a notice of non-referral. A uh, notice of non-referral means that they're not going to adjudicate on the matter or not going to investigate it further. And then uh, the party is free to self-refer to the tribunal which is what I've been trying to do. If the commission refers a matter to the tribunal, they say they investigate it, uh, they uh, sometimes investigate matters, it seems. Um, they haven't investigated any of the matters that I've referred to them, uh, and there have been a, a few dozen. Um, then um, their advocate would refer it to the tribunal. And once again, I'm just going to speak um, frankly to you as between colleagues, um, uh, the commission hasn't once been successful with a, with a matter that they've referred to the tribunal. Literally, they've lost everyone. So I'm, I'm, I'm much keener to self-refer and, and appoint my own advocates and then pursue the matter before the tribunal um, and reach a, a solution there. What's the problem with this? If a consumer has to go through all of these hoops, jump through all of these hoops in order to get to court, what's going to happen? The matter is probably going to prescribe before you can get your uh, summons issued. Um, with regard to the tribunal, if you, um, yeah, there's a, a particular provision if you take a look at section 116 and some of the tribunal um, uh, rulings where they have some type of special dispensation that allows you to get past the three-year prescription problem. Um, yo, I'm just not, I'm not happy to risk that for any of my clients um, because the tribunal rulings don't create a precedent. They're not bound by it. And if your matter then prescribes and it goes to the tribunal and they're not as um, accommodating the second time, that's the end of your client's matter. Anyway, so that's section 69. You can see the problem. Um, for serious disputes, we want to have access to court, right? Um, so I spoke about section 52. I'm not going to repeat it again, but it's um, if you can uh, meet the criteria of an unconscionable act misleading the consumer or an unfair term or price, 
Um, and you can show that the CPA doesn't provide sufficient remedy, which usually is the case. Um, I think that should be an, that's, that's quite an easy uh, hurdle to, to leap over. Then you can apply for these terribly broad um, orders that, that the court is enjoined to make in terms of Section 52. OK, let's see how that has worked out in practice. So we have two cases that have occurred, and these are the first ones um, in South Africa where um, Section 52 has been invoked um, before the courts. Um, I'm going to go back to the skydive um, judgment first, Van Vijk. So that's the case where the engine was destroyed en route from the US to South Africa. And while it was under um, the care of UPS, who were couriering it for Mr. Van Vijk. OK, in this case, he makes use of Section 52. Um, and this is what the judge says about that. Okay, let me give you a little bit more background. The judge finds, um, and we're going to be, I'll, I'll be giving you much more detail on that in due course, that um, the, uh, this, remember this is the credit agreement, um, and the issue was whether the CPA applies or not. The judge finds that the CPA does apply on account of the carve out, um, which says that the goods or services are still governed by the CPA, even where the contract isn't because that because it's a, a credit agreement. OK, so uh, the judge then looks at the purpose of the act and its interpretation refers to the Constitution quite interestingly, and I'll give you a bit more uh, on that when we talk about Section 49. Um, then goes into a long discussion around uh, the um, uh, uh, an indemnity which is included in the contract and whether that indemnity is enforceable or not, um, and then lands as follows. Um, the court essentially finds that the um, that the indemnity is is not enforceable on account of the CPA, and then makes a ruling in terms of section fifty two uh, of the Consumer Protection Act that the clauses in the agreement concluded between the plaintiff and defendant, purporting to limit the risk of liability of the defendant, are severed from such agreement. And that the defendant is therefore held liable for the loss incurred by the plaintiff caused by the de destruction of his aircraft engine when it was conveyed from the United States of America to George um, in the Western Cape. OK, so um, a nice precedent for making use of Section 52 quite effectively in order to strike out an impugned provision in, um, uh, in an agreement. Then the Oersteisen case. So we're back at Mrs. Oersteisen who inherited Wilger Motors and she's wrestling with Puma Energy South Africa um, as to whether they're going to arbitrate on their dispute or not. Okay. Um, she makes use of Section 52 in order to ask the court to and make a declaration that the arbitration clause in her agreement with the, de with the uh, dealer, with uh, Puma, sorry, in the dealer agreement, which is entered into with Puma, um, is unconscionable, unjust, unreasonable, and or unfair, as envisaged in Section 52.3 of the Consumer Protection Act. Um, she also asks, in terms of Section 52, for a cease order, she asks that the first respondent be required to cease any practice directing or compelling the applicant to submit to arbitration in terms of the aforesaid clause 26 in that dealer agreement. What is the court's response? Um, the judge finds that the CPA doesn't assist Mrs. Westeisen 
because she is not a consumer as required by the CPA. Um, it also finds that the arbitration clause, clause contained in the dealer agreement was neither unconscionable, unjust, unreasonable, or unfair, and consequently, the application fails. Unfortunately, there's not a not much of a discussion about how to apply Section 52. It's quoted, um, and then and then the, the judge finds that the um, applicant is not a uh, consumer. In other words, it doesn't apply. So a, a pity that there's not a longer discussion in the uh, in the judgment. But at least we see that it's absolutely key to demonstrate that the thing that you want struck out or um, in respect of which you want the cease order, you have to show that it's either unconscionable, unjust, unreasonable, or unfair. And the problem that um, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Westhausen runs into is that the provisions that deal with unfairness, specifically the gray list in uh, regulation uh, 44 um, under the CPA regulations, only um, apply to, and those uh, presume that a, an arbitration clause is unfair, unreasonable, or unjust, strangely enough, um, because it excludes the um, jurisdiction of the courts. That's the reason that, they, that it's regarded as being unjust uh, to consumers. That, unfortunately, only applies where you have a, um, a consumer who is not acting in the course of their business. So um, Mrs. Westhausen went to pains uh, in the course of the evidence that she led in this, uh, um, sorry, it's an application, I suppose, in her affidavit, to indicate that she was not acting in the ordinary course of her business but that she was in fact a banker with 30 years experience and that she just inherited this um, garage Vulcan Motors and as a result, it was a side hustle for her. <laughs> anyway, the judge didn't fall for that um, and, and that's the outcome. Right, um, how can you get direct access to court? Um, you can, I, I think I discussed all of these with you yesterday, you can, um, make a claim based on in the alternative the common law and in the alternative the CPA. Um, you can wait for the supplier to sue you if you're the consumer um, and then uh, raise your claim as a, um, as a counterclaim. Um, section 52 we've just discussed and to my mind, sorry, uh, damages claims have to be um, adjudicated by courts as the tribunal does not deal with those nor uh, any of those other bodies except maybe for a serious arbitrator um, uh, equipped to deal with damages claims and quantify those. Okay, right, so let's take a look at all the judgments. I'm not going to discuss Joe Roy 4440 CC versus portraited with you because um, those of you who attend my seminars every year know, <laughs> know Joe Roy very well by now. Um, the judgment says that, um, said that Mr. Potchiter had to exhaust all of his remedies. Um, the consumer had to exhaust all of his remedies in terms of section 69. In other words, all of those little bubbles um, on, my, on my slide um, before coming to court, and he said that there was no, the judgment stated that there was no ambiguity in section 69. Um, I was subsequently involved, um, assisting a little bit from the from the sidelines with uh, an application brought by a Mrs. Kruger in the Western Cap. Um, it was an uh, application for an interdict. Once again, a consumer who didn't want to go to arbitration. It was in the context of a relationship with a um, uh, with a, a builder. So it was a building contract went wrong. Um, there was about almost a million rands worth of glass that was um, either specified incorrectly by the architect or um, ordered in the wrong way by the builder or um, produced uh, not in accordance with the appropriate specifications or instructions by the um, glassware supplier. And Mrs. Kruger 
I mean, she's not a glassware expert. She couldn't tell which one of the three was uh, had 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 caused the problem, but she knew that they were jointly and severally liable in terms of the CPA to her as a consumer because of the defects in the glass that was actually delivered to the building site. The um, when she stopped paying the builder, the builder declared a dispute in terms of the JBCC contract, you know, the standard building contracts um, that all contain a, an arbitration clause. Mrs. Kruger was not keen to go into arbitration with just the builder because she knew the builder could very easily point a finger at either the um, uh, architect or the glassware supplier and probably be able to prove it. Um, do in the course of the arbitration, but that one of the three must be liable. So she needed a joint and several liability forum um, and the arbitration uh, tribunal, uh, sorry, the, arbit the arbitrator was would be, and un un um, there wasn't space to join the others in the arbitration. So um, she brought an urgent application to the Cape High Court. Unfortunately, it wasn't it, it's not a reported case and the judgment is a very brief one without any argument in there. But anyway, her, she got her, um, she, she got her, uh, her order um, and, um, and, and I think the dispute is still ongoing. So she's, she issued summons um, shortly after the interdict was granted um, against all three the um, members of the supply chain. Um, even though it wasn't reported, even though we didn't get um, uh, argued uh, reasons for the judgment, um, Dennis Davis seems to have agreed that Section 69 isn't, um, doesn't, didn't preclude Mrs. Kruger from, from approaching the court. Um, she hadn't exhausted any of the other remedies. She came straight to court. Okay. Um, right, let's refer to... Mapuche versus Moto deal. Um, this is a classic CPA case, a second-hand car bought from a dealership. The vehicle was advertised as having a full service history, but then as soon as Mrs. Mapuche takes the car um, for a service, the um, the agent says no, <laughs> there's no service history on their system. Um, she then went to the National Consumer Commission, um, where a miracle shall never cease, uh, an actual mediation happened. Um, and the, but unfortunately, the mediation went against her. Um, and then she referred the dispute to the motor industry on board. Once again, they made a ruling or a recommendation against her and then she approached the courts okay what does the court say about all of this so she she hasn't quite ex, uh, exhausted all of her remedies but she's she's tried quite a few what the judge says is that he refers to sorry let me just tell you which court this is it's the South Gauteng High Court in Joburg the judge refers uh, rightly to Joe Roy 4440CC versus Portgieter, and then also refers to another new case, um, Nswana versus Duke's Motors, with trading as Dampier Nissen. Um, he quotes from there, uh, Joe Roy says, um, I am not of the view that section 69 can reasonably be construed to have more than one meaning at all. So that's the provision that says there's no ambiguity. Um, the wording of the section is clear and unambiguous. It's specifically stated that the consumer may approach the court if all the other avenues have been exhausted. The legislature was, legislature was very specific in prescribing the redress that a consumer has in terms of this section. I failed to see any other interpretation. Um, Then um, in the Zwana matter, which is quoted subsequently, um, it was held that the provision, provisions of Section 69 do not infringe on the provisions of Section 34 of the Constitution, which is our access to court provision in the Constitution. The court held that Section 69 had to be complied with before the court was approached. 
and in quotes from there. And in brief, the outcome is that, oh yes, then the, um, the judge refers to section 4.1 of the CPA. And I have in the past thought that that might be an, an, a way around getting <laughs> access to court because section 4.1 is terribly broad. It says the following parties can all get access to court or, or, or to a tribunal. Anyone who is a consumer themselves, anyone representing consumers, a consumer advocate, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do that in respect of any dispute uh, with a supplier. What does the judgment say? Um, in Mapuzze, uh, section 4.1 of the CPA uh, was referred to by the counsel for the applicant. They contended that the applicant has a right to approach a court alleging that a right in terms of this act has been infringed, impaired or threatened or that prohibited conduct has occurred. This is indeed the case, but it is a last resort if one proceeds in terms of this act. You must first exhaust your remedies in terms of section 69 and then you can approach a court. So, um, what does he recommend to the to the applicant, since the applicant remains at liberty to utilize any of the dispute resolution mechanisms available in terms of the CPA, um, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on the merits at this stage, the judge says. Um, however, at least he feels that it would not be fair to penalize the applicant with a, course, with a costs order and each party is ordered to pay their own costs. So, what remains for Mrs. Mapuzze is that she can try and persuade the um, dealership that sold her the vehicle to go to alternative dispute resolution, or she can approach a consumer court if there's one in her province. And if she bought the vehicle in terms of the of a, um, uh, if, if it was financed uh, in terms of a credit agreement, she can appro approach the national credit regulator if she can find some grounds there. So those are the grounds that remain to her. However, I imagine that the matter would, would prescribe um, before uh, she would be able to approach the court again. So and a very unfortunate outcome for, uh, for consumers in Mapuzze. Then in Wenzel versus Autofit, we find a very different decision. Um, once again, this is... Uh, Defective vehicle, which was purchased new from Renault. Um, maybe I should tell you what car it is and then you can avoid them. Um, a, Renault, a Renault Quid, K-W-I-D. So um, this time a Mrs. Wenzel purchased a new Quid. She returned the vehicle to, um, to Renault, but they failed to, to reimburse her. Uh, there were a whole lot of defects in the in the new car, and pretty much from the moment that she started driving it, she um, she bought it on the 15th of January 2018, and on the 14th of March she already returned it. Um, maybe you can evaluate the level of the seriousness of the of the defects on this new car. It's energy mo emergency mobilizer activated at unexpected times. It made a ticking sound. The back panels of the vehicle started to pull off. The roof rails started to pull, pull off the vehicle. The Bluetooth car kit and uh, car kit does not work when the vehicle exceeds 70 kilometers per hour. The side window is loose. The foot brakes, and this is a more serious aspect, are faulty and they screeched. Um, the central locking system didn't work and there was a faulty module as well as a rattling sound. So those were the defects that you returned the vehicle with. The applicant then referred the dispute to the Motor Industry Ombudsman of South Africa. And while the matter was still um, before my and they hadn't um, finalized the dispute, she then went to court. Um, what does the ruling find on that? Let's just find out whose ruling this is. This one is in North Gauteng High Court. So um, we have uh, Joburg versus Pretoria here with, with completely different rulings on Section 69. 
are going to quote from the case, uh, from the, the judgment. Um, the applicant contended, okay, uh, sorry. The applicant referred the dispute to the Motor Industry Ombudsman of South Africa, Myosa. However, it would seem that there was delay or inaction in finalizing the dispute by Myosa. The applicant cannot refer the matter to the National Consumer Commission while the matter is still pending before Myosa. She finds herself obliged to approach the court for the relief set out above. She wants to, um, she's claiming her purchase price back. Um, in terms of the CPA, uh, the applicant contended further that she has exhausted all her remedies provided to her in terms of section um, 49, 55 and 56. So section 49 says that you have to notify a consumer if there's a particular, um, uh, uh, if there's a, an, an onerous provision in, in, in your contract or any risk in respect of the vehicle that you're selling to them. And then section 55 um, gives a consumer all kinds of implied warranties when they purchase any goods. Um, and section 56 says if the implied warranties are breached, then a consumer can return the, the, the goods, the defective goods within six months and get their money back or get it, uh, the, the, the goods repaired or uh, replaced. The judge then says, in my view, consideration of these remedies requires a pragmatic approach. It brooks no argument that traversing each and every remedy presents time frames and expenses. It could hardly have been the intention of the legislature to create a much more laborious and expensive mechanism for consumers to follow before approaching the court. That type of approach would be prejudicial to consumers, firstly, in that it would be a laborious and expensive process. Secondly, by the time the consumer had exhausted all the available processes, they would be met with prescription by the time they approach the court. In my view, it suffices if the consumer has embarked on at least one of the available remedies as the applicant in Casu did by approaching Myosa, which he found wanting. This must be so because sections 69 and 70 are not couched in peremptory terms and therefore is, it is open to the consumer to pick and choose one of the alternatives available. I find that the applicant has substantially complied with the requirement that she exhaust the remedies afforded to her before she could uh, approach the court and then he orders that the um, a respondent must repay the applicant the total purchase and finance charges for the Renault quid in the amount of 256,000 odd. Okay, so as you can see, clear as mud. <laughs> um, I'm going to give us five minutes to just stretch legs, uh, grab a cup of tea, and we'll reconvene again at 10 past 12 for the last stretch of the seminar. Thanks.
Okay, let's uh, let's resume for the last little stretch. It looks as though there's not going to be much time to answer the questions um, uh, during in the course of the of the allowed time. So I'm going to finish the seminar so that you get the value of, for money that you've uh, that you've paid for, and then I'm happy to continue for another 15 minutes and just answer all of the questions that there wasn't space for. Um, in yesterday's seminar. So if you asked a question or you're interested in the answers to yesterday's seminar that deals with how we can apply the CPA to the um, pandemic and the legal issues that arise from that, um, as well as some more general CPA questions, um, stick around. Um, if you're unable to, if you are e eager to hear all of that and you're unable to stick around because you have another appointment um, at the end of, uh, of the seminar, feel free to ask the Law Society for the recording. I'm going to be recording up to the end of the, uh, of the question Q&A session. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because I dealt with it yesterday as well as this one and continue on to speaking about sections 55 and 56 quality goods, goods and services. So as we mentioned yesterday, um, in order to supplement the common law uh, 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 warranties that apply to certain transactions. The CPA has provided for all of these warranties, um, uh, the four on this slide, um, as, uh, as well as um, the provision at the end of section 55, in other words, 55.6, which is the bit in bold on this slide, that says that you can have something sort of similar to a foot to its clause um, if the consumer expressly agrees to it in effect. Okay, so that's the short version. The important part for us obviously is what if the um, warranties are in fact breached. So you purchase goods uh, or even you rent goods um, and it, it turns out that the, the goods are not of good war, uh, of, of good quality, they're not lasting, etc, etc. You're having um, problems right up front. So the remedy uh, in terms of section 56 is that the consumer has the right within six months after delivery to require the defect to be remedied, the item to be replaced or a refund of the price paid. And here, once again, I want to refer you to Vensel versus Auto Fit Center. Um, from a consumer perspective, a, a lovely decision because um, the judge was so sympathetic in respect of section 69 of the CPA, but um, which has been the, the, the nightmare in my world. Um, but let's see what the judge finds in, in terms of the application of sections 55 and 56. So 55 is the implied warranties and 56, um, the remedy, uh, repair, replacement or refund. Okay. Right, I'm reading from the judgment. Um, the judge starts by going into the purposes of the CPA. We've covered that. I'm not going to read that to you again. Then he goes on to say, the act accords the consumer the right to be supplied with good quality goods. In my view, for a new vehicle to have so many defects, some pointed out whilst it was still in the showroom, it can hardly be said to be of good quality. The applicant as a consumer has inter alia a right within six months of delivery to return the goods without any penalty and to be refunded the full purchase amount. The consumer may require the supplier to repair the goods or replace the goods as well. The applicant returned the vehicle to the first respondent on more than one occasion. She complained on further subsequent, she complained on further subsequently discovering defects. The fact that she initially chose to have the vehicle repaired does not obliterate her right to demand repayment or replacement of the goods. Okay, very importantly. There's also a provision in section 56.3 which says that if goods have been returned and repa repaired and then within a further three months they still show problems, then you can return the vehicle and it then has to be 
your purchase price has to be returned. Um, so a, con a supplier can't keep on repairing, 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 and new problems arise, and they just have the right to keep on repairing. Um, right. So the, the judgment then, the respondents are jointly and severally, the one paying the other to be absolved, ordered to repay the applicant the total, total purchase and finance charges for the reno quid. So um, very nice outcome for the, for the um, consumer and quite an interesting approach. Even if you take the, the judgment here says, even if you take the vehicle back, and you say to them, I, I have these problems, you don't need to necessarily, it sounds as though she didn't necessarily say, I'm taking the vehicle back and you must refund me now. She allowed them to repair uh, the problems, um, and then went back to go and complain uh, f uh, a further time, because I've been very anxious with clients who have allowed replace replacement of certain parts and then a repair and then this and that and woo, we're getting closer and closer to the six months and then i've said to them you take the we i'm gonna return the car for you now so i draft a whole letter saying we hereby return in terms of section 56 of the cpa and we demand for the a refund of the full purchase price these are the defects um, and these are the periods at which, uh, during which they were discovered, et cetera, so that there's a formal return of the vehicle. The judge seems to think that that approach isn't necessary. I'm not sure I'm going to change my approach, but nevertheless, there's a bit of leeway for consumers. Right. Um, I've put on the slides, I'm really definitely not going to go through all of these, but a whole lot of uh, tribunal decisions that deal with various aspects to do with uh, the remedy for, for um, uh, defective um, goods. What do you do if the defect is simply cosmetic? Um, must the dealership repair, replace the engine or replace the vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. So you can take a look at those tribunal decisions at your, at your leisure. Um, then I want to turn, uh, we have a little over 10 minutes to quickly deal with commercial agreements um, and then one or two other uh, aspects. Um, there's some interesting case law on Section 48. So as we discussed yesterday, Section 48 says that you're not allowed to supply goods at an unfair price or on terms that are unfair, unreasonable or unjust and that you must administer the transaction in a fair, reasonable, and just manner if you are the supplier. Okay. And then here's some information about how we evaluate whether something is fair, reasonable, and just, and what the and what the, the outcome is. One of the specific provisions in terms of um, dealing with, with agreements um, is that that has been uh, getting a lot of uh, airtime and, uh, and, and I have a lot of instructions arising from this, especially in the context of leases, is section 14 that deals with fixed term agreements. So we discussed that yesterday and there are quite a lot of questions about that. If you hang around for the questions, you'll hear them. Um, uh, section 14 says that a consumer may cancel that's the second bullet point. A consumer may cancel the fixed term agreement without penalty or charge on 20 business days notice, except that there can be a, a reasonable cancellation fee. And um, in Gravenstein versus Mbombela Golf Club, apologies for the for the typo there, we, we uh, golf club is, is, is owed in O. Um, that's the exact issue that came up. The situation uh, uh, dealt with is a commercial lease, which has a lex commissoria, in other words, a cancellation right um, for both parties, which gives the tenant 14 days to remedy a breach. So um, the, uh, there's a cancellation right, um, but um, and then there's a breach provision. And in terms of the provisions of the commercial lease, a tenant has 14 days to remedy the breach. Um, what is the issue here? Well, um, I think rather artificially, 
the, um, the tenant is relying on the idea that they can stay in the premises, they don't need to exit, because the landlord purported to cancel uh, their lease in terms of the Lex Commissoria, they gave the tenant only 14 days to remedy the breach. Um, I think they stopped paying at some stage and the landlord only gave them 14 days because that's what the contract says. Um, Gravenstein, the tenant, then came to uh, came running to the North Gauteng High Court and said, how's this? The landlord has only given me 14 days to remedy the breach, but the CPA applies to this agreement. And um, the CPA's provisions say that I must have 20 days to remedy the breach. So that's not on the slide. Go and read it. Uh, read the detail in section 14. There's a provision that says the landlord may cancel um, uh, the agreement uh, in the case of breach by a tenant provided that he has allowed the tenant 20 business days to remedy the breach. Um, the judge finds that um, the cancellation right in section 14 is in addition to any contractual cancellation right that the supplier has um, in terms of the lease agreement and that it's perfectly fine to rely on the Lex Commissoria or the uh, breach provision in the lease itself, rather than the section 14 provision um, allowing the landlord to cancel. So uh, the, the cancellation um, in terms of the lease is regarded as being uh, perfectly adequate and compliance with that is in order, even though the, the period um, for remedying the breach, 14 days is insufficient. I'm sure that it uh, part of the, the um, basis for the decision by the North Hutting High Court was that even though a lot more than 20 business days after the notice was given um, had passed by the time that the uh, ruling was made, that the judgment was brought out, um, at least at the time of the hearing, the, um, the lease hadn't, the, the rental hadn't been caught up yet. So <laughs> um, one, of the, one of those uh, judgments that's um, uh, per perfectly understandable, I think. Then um, ShopRite Checkers versus Neves, um, another section 14 case. Okay, this pertains to another sub uh, section of section 14, which says that at the end of a lease, um, a fixed term lease agreement, the lease uh, changes into a month to month uh, agreement. Um, and there is some slightly weird, I mean, there's a lot of weird drafting in the CPA, but uh, the tenant tries to make, sort of grab onto the wording here and say, at the end of a fixed term lease, only the tenant can decide whether to continue with the lease. Um, the landlord must give them the option to continue or to, or to have the lease uh, terminate. And it's... It's, it's only within the, the discretion or the decision-making of the tenant to decide whether the lease will continue. Obviously, if there's a fixed-term uh, lease and it comes to an end and the, and the landlord now wants a different tenant or wants to move in himself or whatever, doesn't like this tenant, the agreement is, has terminated and he can expect the, um, the tenant to move out. So that's what the judgment says. This one is in the Western Cape High Court. Um, and uh, and it was a, a a commercial lease. Okay. Then uh, section forty eight: unfair, unreasonable, and unjust contract terms. Um, let's take a, a quick look at what the judgments say in terms of when contract terms are unfair, unreasonable, or unjust. So we're going to revisit West Dazen once again. Um, as well as looking at uh, Osmond Tires and Spares and PSG. In fact, can I take it from the bottom up? I'm going to refer to PSG first. 
um, then Osman and then Westhausen. Right, PSG, uh, quite an unusual application of the CPA um, on a restraint of trade. So we have PSG wealth uh, financial planning as the applicant in this matter before the Eastern Cape High Court in Grahamstown. Um, PSG have um, two employees who have left their employment and uh, started to uh, started to work for a competitor. They're both brokers. Um, and now the um, there's a restraint of trade in their employment contracts and now PSG is wishing to enforce that. So this is a dispute about whether Section 48, whether contract terms need to be fair, reasonable and just apply to a restraint of trade in a relationship, in, a, in an employment contract between a brokerage and a broker. Okay. Um, the submission is made by the respondents that based on the Consumer Protection Act, the restraint is excessively one-sided in favor of the applicant, in other words, of the employer and ex-employer, and that therefore mm -hmm. Section 52 of the Act enjoins the court to declare the, uh, the whole or part of the agreement that contravenes Section 48 void. Okay. So they're applying in terms of Section 52, the silver bullet, um, to have uh, the restraint of trade de declared void because they feel that it is excessively one-sided in favor of the employer. Okay. Now, can we take a step back before I read any further? Um, and I can just give you my view on what, what the judgment maybe should have been in my um, humble estimation. Um, in the context of an employment relationship, the employee is the supplier of goods and services to the employer who only supplies a salary to them, right? So the employer is not the supplier. Um, consequently, the CPA doesn't apply to this situation because of that exemption, right? Um, only Section 61 of the CPA applies. Uh, that's the exemption under Section 50. Uh, sorry, under Section 5 that we discussed right in the beginning. Okay, so what we're dealing with here is an employment contract. CPA doesn't apply from start. Um, uh, and in any event, it would only protect the employer as the consumer in the relationship, not the employee. So altogether, this is completely a misconstrued uh, argument to my mind. However, the judge doesn't see it that way. Um, uh, the judge actually entertains the issue. Um, and goes into whether the CPA applies for various other reasons. So um, the employer, PSG, contended that the CPA doesn't imply, apply in this case on account of the definition of service. So they look at uh, the definition of service, which ex excludes certain financial services like banking, or includes banking and then excludes certain provisions. Um, but they never refer to the Financial Services General Laws Amendment Act, which excludes all of the financial board legislation amongst other brokerages in specific terms. <laughs> anyway. Um, what the judge says is that services are already regulated by the FASE Act, the Long-Term Insurance Act, and the Short-Term Insurance Act, which are all excluded from the provisions of the CPA. That's true enough. Um, to say that the, that a term or condition is one-sided against a consumer is not enough. It must be excessively one-sided against the consumer. And that's, that's correct as well, but not relevant. Um, so um, in the circumstances, the judge finds that the restraint of trade is not excessively one-sided. Um, he further goes on to say, all that Section 48 has done is to codify the common law in this regard. It did not introduce any new test or formula. However, please read that. This is me uh, adding it. In the context of a restraint of trade. So as you know, a restraint of trade needs to be reasonable in order to be enforceable and not unconstitutional. Okay, I'm going to quickly scoot through Osman 
and then I'm going to leave off Worstosen because we've already discussed it so much. Um, Osman Tires and Spares versus ADT Security um, is a uh, deals with a contract between ADT, the security provider, um, and the applicant. Sorry, it's an appellant. It's before the uh, the Supreme Court of Appeal, Osman Tires and Spares. Um, there's a, a contractual term in the agreement that ADT would exercise reasonable care in the rendering of its services according to an objective standard. However, there's also a provision um, that AT ADT could contract out of liability for negligent uh, conduct. So the dispute is partly about how to deal with the exclusionary provision in the agreement and whether that is allowable in terms of uh, section, uh, in terms of, of the CPA as well as specifically section 48, as well as the private security industry uh, um, legislation. Um, what the court finds and what I find very useful is that he says that the pleadings are wide enough to raise the inquiry in respect of Section 48, despite Section 48 of the Consumer Protection Act not having been pleaded specifically. So if your pleadings are pretty general, then you can still bring in uh, an argument based on the CPA um, uh, if, you, if, you, if that only occurs to you just before the trial. Okay. Um, Section 49, um, I think we've got a minute or two and I'm quickly going to uh, finish as far as I can. Oops. Sorry, I'm just finding the, the judgment. between the 14 of them. There we go. Um, section 49 requires uh, various provisions in a contract if they're onerous to be brought to the attention of a consumer. Let's quickly see what the Wenzel case says about that. Um, that's the case where uh, there were all of the different rattles and problems and bits pulling off the vehicle um, that Mrs. Wenzel purchased and she wanted to return that within uh, six months and get her purchase price back. Um, the judgment finds, and I'm going to give you the brief version, you're welcome to go and read it, it's a really short one, um, that the um, that the uh, fact that all of the um, noises and other defects that the respondent contended were par for the course with the type of vehicle that you that you purchased, uh, that, that Mrs. Wenzel pur purchased, the Renault Quid, um, that that was not disclosed to her in terms of Section 49, and consequently that the um, dealership, that the Renault uh, supplier could not uh, rely on those. So once again, a very helpful judgment um, indicating what happens if you breach section 49. For those of you who are contractual drafters, definitely comply with section 49 when you're drafting. Okay, then with the case where UPS was transporting the, the engine back to South Africa, um, what is said about section 49 is that um, Section 49 clearly seeks to advance the very aim and purpose of the CPA, which is to promote a fair, accessible and sustainable marketplace for consumer products and services. Um, this section clearly and unambiguously seeks to protect a consumer where a notice or agreement purports to limit the risk or liability of the supplier or any other person. Um, and it seeks to temper the unjust or unfair application of the caveat subscriptor rule, especially on unsuspecting and illiterate consumers. It further seeks to prevent the formalistic application and harsh consequences 
um, of uh, Afrox Healthcare versus Stradom, and then he quotes from that uh, judgment, the Act now clearly places a legal duty on a supplier of goods or services to bring such clauses clearly and ambiguously to the attention of a consumer when it concludes a transaction with such a consumer, which falls within the ambit of the CPA. It cannot be concealed in an obscure and opaque section of the agreement, which the consumer is not aware of. The supplier must be open, transparent, and honest in its dealings with a consumer if it wants to rely on such a provision in a consumer agreement. Um, and the purpose is to avoid a situation where the consumer is caught off guard or where a consumer would be tripped up by an unscrupulous or indifferent supplier. Then he finds that even though the plaintiff is an experienced businessman who has concluded many contracts and the supplier felt that he must have been aware of indemnity clauses in contracts, that that doesn't avail the um, supplier. Um, even the fact that the um, Mr. Silver, the um, sorry, the the the. Uh, consumer in this situation had made use of the services of UPS previously and therefore must have been aware of the defendant's contracts and all that they contain, um, was, did not avail either. Um, it does not absolve the defendant from its obligations placed on it in terms of the CPA, which the defendant clearly did not comply with. That's the judgment um, in respect of Section 49. So, uh, once again, underlines the importance. Um, my, the final case that I want to refer to, and just very briefly, and then I'm going to just return to the uh, to the, the questions from yesterday's session, um, is the Cole versus Pinar case, and it's in the context of suppliers' accountability. In other words, the obligation that we discussed yesterday um, on suppliers to hold prepaid funds separately to not treat them treat them as a property of the supplier to um, safeguard them with care and diligence um, etc so in the case of coal versus pinar um, the um, the plaintiff is a person who has made use of a lay by service to purchase building materials for a, a house that he wanted to to um, uh, have built. Um, he had already paid 90,000 Rand of the amount um, in advance as a prepayment against tiles and other building materials. The comment in the judgment is that Section 65.2 of the CPA places a heavy burden on a supplier to deal appropriately with the money of a person who acquires goods or services on lay-by and um, uh, the the um, in brief the uh, the, the um, exception by the first defendant is upheld, and um, and they're entitled to rely on section sixty five. Okay, I'm going to turn to. Um, I haven't dealt with section sixty one of the CPA, but we spoke about that yesterday. And then please take a look at the rest of the slides. I've covered everything that I wanted to. Um, uh, it, in order to um, to to get your bearings with um, with the case law that I've referred to, etc. There, but uh, that's it. Um, then the questions that I wanted to answer from yesterday's seminar. Um, the first one was a question from Carly. She asks if there's a contract for um, adverts to be placed in a directory, does this count as goods or services in terms of the CPA? It sounds to me as though it's primarily services, um, uh, but to the extent that there are goods involved as well, maybe the person who, um, if you subscribe for your details to be placed on the directory and the supplier provides information to you or artwork to you, then that can also be goods. Second question from Carly, does the sale of immovable property from the seller who is not acting in the ordinary course of his business, in other words, not a developer, just an ordinary person who's selling the goods, uh, selling the, the property, 
Is that governed by the CPA if there's also an estate agent involved? Um, partly. So if you take a look, Carly, at section 113 of the CPA, it seems to bring the um, seller back into the loop of the CPA if the um, estate agent has breached any of the provisions of the CPA. So take a careful look at section 113 of the CPA and see whether that doesn't assist in bringing um, the entire transaction uh, back into the ambit of the CPA. So in principle, no, but the relationship between the agent and the seller and the agent and the purchaser are definitely also governed by the CPA um, because the estate agent obviously is acting in the ordinary course um, of his business. Then there was a question from Tabi Lay. My client wants to cancel uh, his timeshare membership due to COVID-19 and a change in his financial situation as a result. Do we follow the usual procedure or will the timeshare be a bit more lenient in the light of the um, pandemic that we're facing? My experience with timeshare companies is that they're never lenient. They're going to ask you ask your client for a for a large cancellation fee. If you want to get around that cancellation fee, you have to cancel the timeshare based on the breach of the timeshare company or um, any defects in the contract, which render the contract invalid. So um, if you, yeah, um, that's one of the things that our office does on a very regular basis. Maybe give me a buzz when you're drafting your cancellation letter and we can assist you with a few tips there um, or even give your client a quote if you feel that's an, an easier way to deal with it. Um, it's not a punt. I'm hoping that's an answer to a question. Um, then there was a question from Ndumiso Kumalo. My client bought a cell phone for cash. Three hours later, he returned it and asked for a refund because he found out that his brother had, in fact, already bought him a phone. The shop refused to take the phone back and give him a refund. They say they only accept returns if the goods are defective. Is that correct in terms of the CPA? Yes, it's correct in terms of the CPA. The CPA's return provisions only apply where goods or services well, goods are defective um, or they are different to, to what uh, the consumer thought in terms of because they were, were um, packaged. And then when the consumer removed the packaging, it, it looked like it, it turned out that they were not fit for the purpose or something like that. So take a look at Section 20 of the Act. Maybe you can find something to assist you. But unfortunately, um, for suppliers, uh, the, the only obligation to take back non-defective goods is if they have some contractual provision in their terms that um, that provides for that. Sorry. Jacques asked a question. What if a company renders an extramural activity at a school? Um, the program runs over a year and all of the fees are prepaid. Now with the lockdown, obviously the supplier is unable to render all of those services, but they've given an undertaking that the missed classes will be caught up and to the extent that that's not possible, the services will be credited on your on the parent's account for the next year. Is that a reasonable alternative to complying with Section 48? In other words, paying back, paying back the, um, uh, the, the prepaid fees or must the supplier tender a refund? I would say the answer is that it's up for negotiation. If a parent um, accepts that, then that's fine. If the parent doesn't accept that, then the, the supplier will be obliged to make a pro rata refund to the extent that services have not been rendered or can't be caught up. Um, Ongama asked a question, does the CPA apply to the sale of secondhand goods such as motor vehicles? Yes, it does if the seller is acting in the ordinary course of their business. So if I sell my car, that's not my ordinary course of business. So the CPA doesn't apply and I can still have a foot to its clause um, uh, in respect of my vehicle. And I know about various rattles and problems. I'm definitely going to want to sell my car foot to its. So, um, but if I were a dealership and selling secondhand cars or um, it, it's a, a thing which, which is a, a sort of a business for me, I like to buy cars and sell them again, um, then uh, you can't have a foot to its clause in the, in the agreement. Krishna has asked, 
does the CPA apply when the consumer is a juristic person, but the end consumer is a natural person? So to my mind, and this is in contrast to one of the judgments that we read today, but I really think that one is patently wrong. This, you can have, a, let's say, the, the first supplier, then you can have a party, which is another supplier in the supply chain, which is a consumer of the, let's say, the manufacturer, but they end supply to a natural person who is a consumer. Okay. In this context, they're a consumer. They may be a juristic person. They may be over the threshold, but Section 61 still applies in this relationship. But in this relationship where the end consumer um, uh, is, is uh, affected, the entire CPA will apply. So, yes, the CPA does still apply. So, the fact that the initial transaction from the manufacturer to the distributor or the retailer or whatever, the, the next supplier in the supply chain, that one is a um, juristic person. That doesn't mean we've excluded the CPA 100%. No, no, the CPA still applies, um, even if the first transaction is up here and the end consumer. Remember, there's the definition of consumer that says even a user or beneficiary that doesn't have a contractual nexus with the supplier is also a consumer who is protected by the CPA. So, yes, Krishna, uh, CPA does still apply. Okay, Kavashini Nyker has asked, does the tenant have to give 20 days notice in terms of section 14 for a month to month lease? Um, well, whether you give 20 days notice or a month's notice, it's pretty much the same thing. But for a month to month lease, that's not a fixed term contract. So section 14 doesn't apply. Um, and with a month to month lease, you would just give the month's notice and then the, uh, and then the, the lease would, would terminate. Okay, Roshan Hammond has asked, um, are we going to be discussing employees' ob obligations to their employers when working from home, where you have a situation where there are high-risk areas in respect of your insurance? I haven't discussed that because that's a little bit outside my field. It's not clearly um, uh, consumer law, um, but I mean, those are real issues that arise from um, legal practice, uh, the employ employment relationship and the pandemic and its results. Um, so, so thanks for raising that. Those are real challenges for business owners as well as for employees, it's true, um, in the legal uh, field. Um, I've seen some great material put out by the law firm Guy and Associates in Cape Town that's been put out on social media and I'm sure it's available on their website. Take a look at that. That gives amazing guidance for employers and employees um, uh, alike in terms of how to deal with a, with a pandemic um, and, and all of its challenges and opportunities actually. Mbulelo Daose has asked, um, are late payment penalties permitted in terms of the CPA and how can you assess compliance with the CPA in respect of these late pay, uh, payment penalties? Uh, Mbulelo, I'm just nervous that what you're talking about is a credit agreement. If it's a credit agreement, you're going to have to apply the principles in the Credit Act, um, which, uh, which deals quite much more comprehensively with the type of penalty that a, a credit provider can charge or not. If it's not a credit agreement, then the provisions in the CPA that will apply are Section 48 that says you must have a fair price and a fair and fair contract terms in your agreement. So you're going to have to use a bit of creativity and evaluate what is excessively unfair toward um the consumer in this situation uh, evaluate based on what we discussed relating to section 48. Then my final page of, of answers, G. Bloch has asked, um, if a flight is to or from South Africa, so you start in South Africa or end in South Africa, does that count as goods and services supplied in South Africa so that the CPA would apply to it? I would say yes, in my view, yes, that's correct. I suppose one could get technical about it and say that to the extent that the, there's an incident on the flight that happens as soon as we're out of South African 
airspace and we're already in Namibia or Botswana or wherever we're going over the sea. And then that, that, that portion of it won't be governed by the CPA, but in principle, the purchase of the flight and the uh, cancellation of the flight and all of that, because a portion of it is in South Africa or over South African airspace and then landing in South Africa uh, or, or lifting off, Yes, that would be governed by the CPA. Then Bertram has asked, a client has approached me regarding a refund to obtain a refund from the supplier. I've already written to the supplier, but now um, I think we should rather complain to the ombud. Can I withdraw um, in order to allow the client to go to the ombud? So very well picked up, Bertram. Um, the, con the ombud, the consumer goods and services ombud deals with matters where the, the consumer isn't represented. So yes, you will need to withdraw. So you can just write an email to the client to say, maybe pick up the phone and say to them, I have to withdraw, but I, I mean, I'm available to you in the background. <laughs> um, so formally just withdraw, write them an email to say I withdraw from the matter, or you can ask them for a, an email to say I hereby terminate your mandate uh, on account of referring the matter to the ombud. And then you but ask him to keep you informed so that you can see what the, um, the outcome is. And, and you can certainly advise him behind the scenes if the ombud asks a question that he finds difficult to, your client finds difficult to answer, et cetera. So yes, I've um, done that type of fancy footwork a few times uh, in my practice. And then of course you can come back on board if uh, the client isn't happy with the outcome at the ombud um, uh, as, soon as, as soon as the um, recommendation has been made. Right, the last question uh, from Krishna, can a tenant, which is a natural person, um, but a tenant in the context of a commercial lease, demand a refund of their rent during lockdown? I think they probably can based on uh, force majeure. Um, so in, the, in Krishna's context, they've already paid that rental but they weren't able to occupy the premises on account of the lockdown. To my mind, yes, you can demand a refund. I think landlords, commercial landlords especially are pretty hard nosed. So you're gonna to struggle to get actual money back, but maybe you can negotiate um, a, a, a remission in your future rental uh, equivalent over a period of months of the, of the excessive amount that you paid for the period that you weren't in fact able to occupy the premises. So, um, Yes, all the best with that um, tough negotiation. Thank you, everyone. Um, yes, Chris, now I've answered your question. And then thanks for all the comments. Um, see you again next year, whether it's face-to-face -face or, or by way of a webinar again. If you have any comments with regard to the webinar itself, please pass those on to the Law Society to lead so that we can make sure that we continuously upping our game. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.